Hi, I'm sure. Ooh, there we go. Hi, I'm Charlene. Um, before we get started, I did want to share a story with you all. So, I have a coworker. Um, you know, he has fibromyalgia, PTSD, and major depression. Right. So, often the mental illness, in addition to the fibromyalgia, manifests as excruciating physical pain. You know, and I think everyone in this audience can sympathize with that. Um, and like me, he takes the elevator every day up into the office. But sometimes, you know, he'll take the elevator only for one flight or two flights. And one time when he was exiting the elevator, another coworker of mine just jokingly said, what, doesn't his legs work, you know? And I'm sure we're all familiar with those kind of microaggressions. Um, she, you know, she kept trying to egg me on to agree with her, and I just kept being like, I don't know, I don't know, no, no, I mean, it's an elevator, come on, you know? Um, and, you know, the story shouldn't surprise anyone. Those kind of microaggressions are so common, right? What's surprising and what probably disappointed me the most was she's also a designer alongside with me who works on inclusive design. And it's just to highlight how pervasive and insidious that kind of ableism is in our culture, that it is so embedded that it passes through culture and into our work. So these are the principles of design as said by Dieter Rams. He was the creative director for Braun. Um, and I don't think there's a designer who would disagree with any of these principles. But I think as designers and technologists, we often forget the purpose each of these statements intend. That design should be unobtrusive. So it shouldn't present an obstacle to anyone trying to use it. It should be useful. God forbid something you make for use can actually be used for that purpose. <laughs> it should be understandable. And that means the how you use it and what its use is should be clear to anyone without complicated instruction or a huge learning curve. And this is something that has to exist within every detail. That is what design is managing every single last detail. And so, one of the modern concepts today is the social model of disability. Now, not everyone is going to agree with it. I, don't re I certainly don't represent everyone who is disabled. And the concept is that we're all susceptible to temporary disability impairments. We're just kind of existing in meat bag bodies, and those meat bags can go wrong at any time. And those kind of impairments are everywhere. And you aren't disabled till you encounter an obstacle. If I am traveling with a friend who is wheelchair bound, we can get to the same places until we encounter stairs, and that the stairs or would, would make that friend disabled. So these are a couple of my favorite quotes. Uh, one is from Brad Frost. The idea being that if we design and produce products that gracefully deprecate, right, they're still usable, no matter what kind of limitations a person might have. The other quote is from a disability activist slash comedian. No amount of smiling has ever turned a staircase into an elevator. Only one of these people can't use a staircase. I like putting these two quotes up together because it highlights in contra that contrast between intention and end result. So what did we break? When HTML first came out, there were relatively few classes. Our headers were just H1 through H6. Paragraph was just a P, you know. 
uh, this was really easy for assistive technology, screen readers, then CSS, then JavaScript, and uh, my favorite is Flash, which was absolutely, completely unable to be used with assistive technology. And if you remember when the iPhone first came out and Steve Jobs said they would not support Flash, there was so much backlash from people who wanted to use YouTube or other, you know, things that depended on flash. And for a while there, it was a little difficult to navigate the internet with your phone because flash was turned off. But in the end, it made for a much more accessible experience. Melody Kramer is a designer for 18F. 18F is the group responsible for all the design for the federal government. She has an 80-year-old friend who really likes to read the news, really avid news consumer. And one day she was sitting down with Betty, watching her use the internet to look at news, and these things started happening. She kept accidentally clicking things, and when she clicked things that were wrong, it created anxiety and fear. Those emotions are so tied to how we consume media. And we often mistake these emotions for ineptness. When someone has fear and anxiety around a technology, there is often that assumption that they're just stupid. Um, and this is something we even assign to people who should be leaders. You know, we talk about certain politicians being stupid or crazy when really we should be holding them responsible for their decisions and not saying that their decisions were limited by some disability, that they are incapable of making ethical decisions. And who does it impact? These are some, just some statistics around just vision, which is the primary impairment that affects us as technologists. 9% of people in the US are nearsighted. 75% of adults need corrective lenses. That's need, not use, because so much of eyewear is beyond the financial reach of people. And that impacts how they consume media, too. And those are the numbers in case the percentages don't help. 240 million people have some form of visual impairment. And these are just numbers that also impact how we design. You know, 46% of the US has some form of chronic illness. And that could be anything from diabetes to uh, asthma. Motor dysfunctions. Those impact how we consume the internet too. And those are just some numbers for that too. 147 million people. So how are people fixing it? This is where things are uh, lighten up a little bit. <laughs> so um, a dark room is a text-based narrative game that was originally designed as a free use game for your desktop and then became available for download through the Apple Store. It's a really strong narrative. It was probably the best dollar I've ever spent in the Apple Store. And the developer of it like many of us, combs the internet for feedback. Jumps on Twitter, looking at all the feedback about it, and he noticed that a lot of eggheads, Twitter accounts without any profile avatar, kept complaining about the same thing. They couldn't use this screen on the far right, the dusty path. And he was totally baffled, you know, it's, it's so simple, you just click N, and you move north, you click E, you go east. Why couldn't they use it? How did they end up playing this game and not be able to use it? And he finally talked to one of these complainers on Twitter, and he realized they were blind. No perception of light blind. Not legally blind, can't see, but dependent on voice control in their technology. He ended up talking with this person and discovering the AppViz community, which is a blind community that focuses on technology used for blind people. And now the game is fully accessible. 
This is an app called Tap Tap C. I think it's pretty awesome. It uses augmented reality to identify objects and orient users in a room. It'll, if you take a picture across the room, it'll tell you that how your distance and what is on that side of the room. It can identify currency. It's a pretty powerful app. So back to Betty. Melody Kramer ended up designing and coding this news aggregator for her friend. It pulls in news from different major media outlets and it renders it in a much friendlier way. Assistive tech can figure out headers, editorial categories, and if you're just visually impaired, it's very clear what data goes with what. This is not a site that people consider reliable. But if you notice, it has the same exact structure. It is accessible. When you tab through it, it focuses on the headers and the content. Same thing. This website, also tremendously accessible. I bring up those examples because oftentimes we talk about inclusion as if there was some magical checklist where we could go through, tick things off, and be better than other people. It's not true. This is the New York Times. Why is their design based on the broadsheet? Newspaper layouts were originally designed so that newspapers would save money on printing, and they would get as much content into that limited amount of space. It's the internet. <laughs> and then there are ads in between content. The ads become obstructive. They have this nice little button at the top that says skip to content. If you're trying to tab through the website, guess how many clicks it takes for me to get to the article? It depends, because sometimes they have different ads. But it's usually around 15 clicks. Yep, and that includes going through social media links, which have nothing to do with the article. Why would I want to tweet about the article before I've read it? I mean, I know people do that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's pretty scary that they don't have any use-driven tabs. That says skip to content. It should actually just skip to the content, right? <laughs> the picture on the right is a railless ramp staircase designed a few years, several years ago, and it circulated around the internet very widely. People were amazed. They thought it was such a great, you know, instance of design where, oh, look, wheelchair-bound people, and it's beautiful because you know ramps have to be ugly, right? Uh, but anyone with engineering skills can look at it and tell you that it would never pass the ADA requirements because that incline is one foot for every six inches or double what the ADA requires. The architect's response, you shouldn't be in a wheelchair without someone who can help you. The picture on the right, you can barely see the ramp, but it's there. This is the Chicago River Walk, and it does follow ADA compliance. It's actually a little lower in incline than the requirements, and while I think you still have to have a lot of confidence to go up stairs without rails if you're in a wheelchair, it's still a lot better than the picture on the left. So these are two more quotes, I, I love quotes. Just because something functions doesn't mean it serves a purpose. Now, when we design things, when we create things, we want to make them special, delightful, you know, fulfill all those weird phrases that uh, startups love to coin, like, this design will change the world. It really doesn't matter if it doesn't serve a purpose. Um, I'm a dog chasing cars. I don't know what I'd do if I caught one. That's the Joker from The Dark Knight. 
but that's kind of, it's related to this because when we try to create things and we forget that end goal, what do you do when you think you've accomplished what you were trying to do? How do you keep evolving your product if you've already lost sight? So closing thought, I love this fact. In the 1960s, even being moderately nearsighted meant you were disabled. And glasses only came in two colors, nude and black. That was only, you know, 57 years ago. We've come a long way. Today, one out of five pairs of glasses is sold without a prescription. I mean, that's a really big deal considering how freaking expensive they are, <laughs> you know? Um, and the point of that is that, you know, there are a lot of con there's a lot of contention around it, but when design turns disability into a fashion accessory, there's something to be said about the inclusive nature of that. Oh, spinners. <laughs> I, I felt like I had to include it just for, you know, um, speaking of trends, right? We're gonna start with the photo on the right, the spinner rings. I got my first one in a head shop while I was looking for a bong. <laughs> it was five bucks. It was really easy. I don't use them anymore because I can just kind of spin my thumb against my finger. It's a little fidget, but because it mimics the same use of that ring, it's soothing. Fidget cubes came along a little afterwards. People started making plastic fidget rings. Um, I could never get one because they were always sold out. And then fidget cubes came along, Kickstarter, also very popular. Now we have these fidget spinners. <laughs> and along with every trend that attracts teens, there's a lot of criticism that's valid and a lot of criticism that isn't. You know, like user, people who use them are stupid. They're not and I don't think they're as pervasive as people think they are, especially when you put into context just how many people in this country have some form of chronic illness. Uh, mental health is another big one. I think the last time I saw the statistics, it's 20%. So unless you see more than one out of five students in a classroom using this, it's probably not just kids who wanna mess up your class. But some teachers I know, and I think they do the right thing, in that if they find this disruptive, they keep a box of goodies, like spinner rings or fidget cubes at their desk, so that kids who do feel like they need one, but the teacher finds the spinners too distracting, have that. And that's the kind of thing we should try to strive for, you know? I never wanna give a checklist because what worked in 1995 stopped working in 1998. And anything I could tell you that would be on a checklist, like the, you know, w, uh, the WCAG standards, those are gonna disappear. But if you can't change your mindset and how you perceive these things, your design will always be broken. So that's it.